Chapter number six of the Altar of the Dead by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Larry Kaplan. She was always in mourning, yet the day he came back from the longest absence he had yet made, her appearance immediately told him she had lately had a bereavement. They met on this occasion as she was leaving the church, so that postponing his own entrance, he instantly offered to turn round and walk away with her. She considered, then she said, Go in now, but come and see me in an hour. He knew the small vista of her street, closed at the end, and as dreary as an empty pocket where the pairs of shabby little houses, semi-detached but indissolubly united, were like married couples on bad terms. Often, however, as he had gone to the beginning, he had never gone beyond. Her aunt was dead, that he immediately guessed, as well as that it made a difference. But when she had for the first time mentioned her number, he found himself, on her leaving him, not a little agitated by this sudden liberality. She wasn't a person with whom, after all, one got on so very fast. It had taken him months and months to learn her name, years and years to learn her address. If she had looked, on this reunion, so much older to him, how in the world did he look to her? She had reached the period of life he had long since reached, when, after separations, the marked clock-face of the friend we meet announces the hour we have tried to forget. He couldn't have said what he expected as, at the end of his waiting, he turned the corner where for years he had always paused. Simply not to pause was an efficient cause for emotion. It was an event, somehow, and in all their long acquaintance there had never been an event. This one grew larger when, five minutes later, in the faint elegance of her little drawing-room, she quavered out a greeting that showed the measure she took of it. He had a strange sense of having come for something in particular. Strange because literally there was nothing particular between them, nothing save that they were at one on their great point, which had so long ago become a magnificent matter of course. It was true that after she had said, You can always come now, you know. The thing he was there for seemed already to have happened. He asked her if it was the death of her aunt that made the difference, to which she replied, She never knew I knew you. I wished her not to. The beautiful clearness of her candor, her faded beauty, was like a summer twilight, disconnected the words from any image of deceit. They might have struck him as the record of deep dissimulation, but she had always given him a sense of noble reasons. The vanished aunt was present, as he looked about him, in the small complacencies of the room, the beaded velvet and the fluted moreen, and though, as we know, he had the worship of the dead, he found himself not definitely regretting this lady. If she wasn't in his long list, however, she was in her niece's short one, and Stransom presently observed to the latter that now at least, in the place they haunted together, she would have another object of devotion. Yes, I shall have another. She was very kind to me. It's that that's the difference. He judged, wondering a good deal before he made any motion to leave her, that the difference would somehow be very great and would consist of still other things than her having let him come in. It rather chilled him, for they had been happy together as they were. He extracted from her, at any rate, an intimation that she should now have means less limited that her aunt's tiny fortune had come to her, so that there was henceforth only one to consume what had formerly been made to suffice for two. This was a joy to Stransom, because it had hitherto been equally impossible for him either to offer her presents or contentedly to stay his hand. It was too ugly to be at her side that way, abounding himself, and yet not able to overflow, a demonstration that would have been signally a false note. Even her better situation, too, seemed only to draw out in a sense the loneliness of her future. It would merely help her to live more and more for their small ceremonial and this at a time when he himself had begun wearily to feel that, having set it in motion, he might depart. When they had sat a while in the pale parlour, she got up. This isn't my room. Let us go into mine. They had only to cross the narrow hall, as he found, to pass quite into another air. When she had closed the door of the second room, as she called it, he felt at last in real possession of her. The place had the flush of life, it was expressive, its dark red walls were articulate with memories and relics. These were simple things, photographs and watercolors, 
scraps of writing framed and ghosts of flowers embalmed. But a moment sufficed to show him that they had a common meaning. It was here she had lived and worked, and she had already told him she would make no change of scene. He read the reference in the objects about her, the general one to places and times, but after a minute he distinguished among them a small portrait of a gentleman. At a distance, and without their glasses, his eyes were only so caught by it as to feel a vague curiosity. Presently this impulse carried him nearer. In another moment he was staring at the picture in stupefaction, and with a sense that some sound had broken from him. He was further conscious that he showed his companion a white face when he turned around on her gasping, Acton Hague. She matched his great wonder. Did you know him? He was the friend of all my youth, of my early manhood. And you knew him? She colored at this, and for a moment her answer failed. Her eyes embraced everything in the place, and a strange irony reached her lips as she echoed, Knew him? Then Stransom understood, while the room heaved like the cabin of a ship, and its whole contents cried out with him, that it was a museum in his honor, that all her later years had been addressed to him, and that the shrine he himself had reared had been passionately converted to this use. It was all for Acton Haig that she had kneeled every day at his altar. What need had there been for a consecrated candle when he was present in the whole array? The revelation so smote our friend in the face that he dropped into a seat and sat silent. He had quickly felt her shaken by the force of his shock, but as she sank on the sofa beside him and laid her hand on his arm, he knew almost as soon that she mightn't resent it as much as she'd have liked. End of chapter 6